Well, good morning still. It's still good morning, isn't it? Yes. Yes, good. And thank you very much, Pastor, for the introduction and for all of you being here. It's wonderful to see so many people allocating a fairly lengthy period of your time to wanting to learn more and to grow more and to deepen more. It's just lovely to see people who are prepared to actually, uh, as I said, grow and uh, become stronger, not only in your faith, your faith is strong, you are here because your faith is strong, but more importantly, you wish to grow to become more connected with other people. And that's the beautiful point that I see today, is people who want to be connecting to others to understand more, to be stronger in faith, and to share that faith with others. Because we are challenged all around the world. We come from Australia, my wife and I, and we are challenged as Christians, not just by atheists or uh, by non-believers. We're also challenged by believers who say they are Christian, but challenge the book as being historical, the Bible and the book of Genesis, arguing that it is not historical. So I want to thank my good friend Con, first of all. We're on first name basis, by the way. He is not allowed to call me Dr. Ron. He is just Con. I am Ron. And if you want to talk to me later, please just call me Ron. Okay? Uh, we put all that aside. That's our past. But thank you for that. Um, but I do thank him because he gave a very excellent overview of the challenges and the problems that we face today and to help us understand and gave us a lot of scripture to read, a lot of material to read, other books and so on that will help us grow and I thank him for that. I'm going to be quite different and this is the agreement we have, I'm going to be much more specific in an example talking about Noah's flood and Noah's flood is a very significant part of the book of Genesis, in fact it's quite a large part of the book of Genesis isn't it? It's rather interesting how much time is spent writing in the book of Genesis about the global flood. But it goes beyond just the book of Genesis. It also goes as Jesus himself connected Noah's flood to his own return as well. And so the flood is very, very uh, important not only in the book of Genesis but also in understanding and uh, understanding our future and understanding also connecting it to Christ himself because Christ himself connected the flood and spoke of the flood yet we are challenged and when I was young I was challenged as a non-Christian I was taught that the flood did not occur and so I thought today let's take care of that you can see there are some qualifications I'm actually very interested in um, Dr. Conn's comment as well about that we are lacking in our Christian uh, Bible colleges and Christian universities around the world that they are not accepting necessarily the book of Genesis as correct. We face the same problem in Australia. We find it extremely difficult for us to connect and talk with people being who are lecturers or so on in Bible colleges and so on. And it's in Australia now, it's not listed up there, but because Con mentioned this is a big problem, we have launched in Australia an initiative where top Christian professors have come together and we are already being given partial approval. We are going to be building a Christian university strongly founded on the book of Genesis where each staff member must accept the book of Genesis as truthful, foundational and uh, historical. And so that's a future event, but the point is it's interesting. We are forced to do this because of our troubles with our own institutions in Australia, as well as I now hear in Singapore and elsewhere. So let's look at the Noah's flood and whether it was global and so on. A little bit of background. I am a person who studies landscapes. Earth scientist is what I am. I roam the world looking at landscapes and floods. I was trying as a non-Christian, because I only gave my life to Christ about 16 years ago, I think it was, 17 years ago. I only gave my life to Christ then. I was looking at landscapes and trying to explain why your landscape is like this and why this landscape is here. 
Why, how was it created by floods or how was it created by storms or so on? And the big word I'm using here is sediments as well. Uh, that's meaning simply dirt. It's the sediment that washes off when you wash away your mountains or your agricultural fields. That soil is what we call sediment. And I became an international expert in landscapes and floods and the sediments. That's why I was, again, fascinated when Con put up the comment that, uh, you know, Christians are not good scientists or, you know, no good scientist would ever become a Christian. I can assure you that around the world now, good scientists are becoming Christian and I was one of them and not necessarily a good one, not as good as Con, but I was good enough to recognize that the science pointed to the Bible, not to evolution. And so I'll share a little bit of that journey with you. It is important to understand that scientists today are giving their life to Christ. Even though the media says no, even though the universities say no, this is happening around the world because our science is now so good, it is giving us insights that we could not see before. It's giving us information. I studied fossils as well and looked at particularly how they were formed and that will be the talk after lunch, by the way. I'll talk to you about how you can become a fossil if that's what you seek to do. And... Uh, but what, what it will require for you to become a fossil. And I also looked at microbial populations for a short time. But to do all of that, to understand that from around the world, I had to travel the world. I had to live in other countries. So I lived for 10 years in China, for example. Southern China and Hong Kong and all that learning to speak uh, Cantonese, Xiu Xiu, okay. I tried, I tried it hard, I tried my best, and I really could speak it quite well when I was living there for 10 years. But I have lost a lot of it, not because of the language, but because I've actually had a uh, uh, brain operation. I had a large, uh, a very large tumor in the brain, and I was given two weeks to live. Uh, but the Lord stepped in, and brought a top quality uh, neurosurgeon and they classified my recovery as a miracle. Now we know it's a miracle, but it's not a miracle from medicine, it's a miracle from God. And so I've lost a lot of my, well, thank, thank the Lord for that one. Um, so one of the funniest things that happened to me in my life was the University of Queensland decided to study me. There is a PhD done on me, and I feel terrible about that. I train people to do PhDs, not to be the lab rat in a PhD, but I became the subject of study of a PhD because they could not understand how, in my situation, which was so close to death, my recovery was so fast and so powerful, and it changed myself, my wife, our whole families, many of them became Christians after what they saw. And so God was so wonderful in setting me on a new path. And that's why I'm here today, part of that, and to build a new Christian university is a part of that as well, is to actually bring the Lord more to God, bring Him glory, and not the academics' glory, not us' glory, but to bring God glory. That's what we're here for. And so I spent 10 years living in China. And... Uh, trying my best. I also did not go as an expatriate or a foreigner. I did not accept that. I went as a local, on local terms. Isn't that interesting? So I was actually blessed then with lots of research facilities because they said, this foreigner is very strange. He's not acting like a foreigner. He's acting like a local. And so they gave me lots of research monies and it was great. Likewise, in Finland, I went to live there for a number of years and learned to speak Finnish. And again, they loved me because I wanted to become Finnish, not an Australian. Or I wanted to become Chinese, not Australian. And I, I went and worked in Libya, in Peru, on the Amazon River, all of those sorts of things. Pacific Islands, South Africa, chasing floods, looking at landscapes, and uh, across Australia as well. Why did I do that? Partially, just to give you some indication of why I was so resistant to God, I was resistant to God, was because I was raised in a very poor, a dysfunctional home. 
with a lot of alcoholism and violence. And so I learnt not to trust. Does that make sense? I sought to travel the world and identify myself in other cultures to try and find out who am I, what is my purpose, what is my role in life. Interesting. But I resisted God. Because if these things have happened to you as a young person, you are often resistant to God. And we have to understand that. But science in the end helped me come to Christ. So did I enjoy that journey? I did. Was I shot at? Yes. Was I arrested by foreign governments? Yes. Was I kidnapped once and attempted, uh, you know, I had to jump from a moving vehicle to get away from that? Uh, was I drugged and robbed? Yes. Did I catch every disease possible? Yes. Was I bitten by snakes and evacuated by helicopters? Yes. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Travelling the world because I was trying to find out who am I, what is my purpose. Yet the answer was so clear, wasn't it? The answer is to give your life to Christ. But I was resistant to that. But science certainly helped me, as did another person. So yes, great, great uh, journey there, travelling around the world, uh, seeing patterns around the world that you don't normally see if you're not travelling. If you're a university researcher in one university, you see the pattern in your area. Another person sees a pattern there. So they give, as, Don, as Con said, they give an interpretation of that pattern, and here is an interpretation. But when you travel the world, you see a different interpretation. You begin to see there is a pattern around the world of something that happened in the past, something that was incredibly catastrophic and damaging in the past. And so I'll share with you a bit of that journey. So as I went around the world, I was teaching evolution. Why? Because I had been taught to teach evolution. Did I understand it? Not really. Did I even believe in it? Not really, but that's what you are told to teach. And so to have my job, to keep my job, I taught evolution. And uh, as Dr. Kahn said, that's exactly what you do. If you don't teach that, well, you can say goodbye to your job. You can say goodbye to your career. If you disagree strongly, you will be terminated, you will be sacked. And so I was teaching evolution wherever I went around the world. Evolution from a landscape point of view, not from a biological point of view, but a landscape that these landscapes represent millions of years old. And I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail in these because that can be heavily scientific. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show you some lots of lovely pictures as I travel the world and show you the features that I looked at that will help you understand. I want, I want, I want to build a picture here, a picture that applies over much of the earth. And I'm going to look at these things here. Don't even worry about their names. I'm just going to show you the pretty pictures about plateaus, sedimentary layers, boulder fields, all those sorts of things. And I'm going to highlight why they do not indicate long periods of time. Now remember, I was a person taught to think long periods of time. But as I was travelling the world doing this research, I kept seeing evidence of short periods of time. And so I became highly confused as I was travelling the world. So these are depositional where sediment is deposited and I'll also show you some of the erosional where sediment is eroded and how these also reflect a young earth. And so all of those things are not separate, they will all come together in an example towards the end. So let's look at some of the depositional features first of all. This planet is unique. This planet, first of all, is very wet. Uh, there's a lot of water, of course, and only 30% of the planet is actually land. But of the land, 70% is made up of sediment, material washed down and put down in layers around the world. And it's not just a shallow layer. This sediment will go 10 kilometres or 16 kilometres deep. It's an incredible amount of sediment. Now, we've been to Mars. We can explore other planets as well using satellites. There are no other planets like ours, which is a sedimentary-covered planet. 
70% of the entire continents are sedimentary covered. In other words, water has washed this over 70%, and I don't mean a little layer, I mean kilometres deep. And not only that, but it is, has this amazing image of a plateau, of a flat surface. So 40% of all of the continents, 40% is actually a plateau. Now, I hope you've been given those notes, by the way. Have they been given out? So I've given you an introduction. So we're down in landforms. There's the plateau down there. So get your pens out. Start writing my notes down. Before I leave this afternoon, I'm expecting a 10,000 word essay to be submitted back from you. I will give you a grade. No, I'm just joking, but it's for you to get a hold of those. And just to put a few notes down there. I won't be touching on all of the notes, just their guidelines for you to see where I'm going with my thinking. You want to put your hand up if you need a pen? Pens are being passed around. Excellent. Well, down in landforms then, looking at the depositional ones, we have the first one is a plateau. In other words, level high ground. It's high up. It's not at sea level. It's high up and it is level. I gave you those figures before. 40% of the entire continents is a plateau. In Africa, it is 60% of Africa is a plateau. So my first question traveling the world is how is it that in a continent like Africa where you can have incredible rainfall in some parts and deserts in the other, so wind is blowing strong in some parts, rainfall is so heavy and eroding things, how come most of Africa is still a plateau, flat. When you look at that top surface there, do you, you don't see it doing this so much. Yes, you have a lot of that here, particularly around the Penang area, but in most of the world you see these wonderful plateaus. Now these plateaus often have one steep side that you see there, but they go back to a more gentle side. So these plateaus are often tilted like this going up, and then they just go boom, straight down. What you're looking at there is where it drops down and we call that a gorge, like the Grand Canyon, like Katoomba Valley in New South Wales where we uh, have been to. And these gorges are all around the world but they are on the edge of plateaus often. So plateaus is a very important feature. Now, people say, well, when I ask the question, why do we have plateaus? I hear the answer because the top rock, and you can see the layers there, the top rock is very hard. It's very resistant. That's the argument. But it's not true. It's not true. Because I could take you to other plateaus, and whilst you see a lot of erosion, you can still see on the top there the plateau. There's the plateau. But here, the hard and the soft layers don't go like this. They're not horizontal. The hard and the soft layers are like this. They go up and down. So they have been bent slightly like this. So the question is, why can we see weak rocks standing there that should have been washed away over hundreds of millions of years? If it's hundreds of millions of years, the landscape should have looked more like this, up and down, all the soft rocks eroded out, all the hard ones. But the surface there, you're just seeing the edge of that plateau. That plateau goes across all of northern New South Wales in Australia. It's massive. And there's just gorges on one part on the coast, like, like that. And yet it's not a hard rock on top. It's a mixed rock. And yet, where is the... Where are the gorges? Where are the gullies? Where are the rivers cutting it up? It's not there. So I found the plateaus were a real problem. The sedimentary layers I found to be another problem. Here we are down in Tasmania, nice and cold down there. And I did live in Finland for many years and I can assure you it's very, very cold if you go to Finland. Has anybody been to Finland? 
Well, if you do, be prepared. The Finnish people want to take you into a sauna, nice and hot, but then you have to run outside. They have a hole in the ice over a lake, and you must jump into the hole, into the freezing waters, and then run back into the sauna. I can assure you, you will love it. You will. It tingles your skin. It's lovely. It's beautiful. And so I started doing it quite often, and I love it. We have saunas in other countries. You probably have them here. We have them in Australia, but they're no good because we cannot run out into absolutely frozen water. And that's what makes a sauna so good. But in, uh, in Port Arthur, it's also pretty cold down there, but you can see the sedimentary layers. They're all nicely horizontal. Just to highlight that, I've put in a couple of lines there for you to see these sedimentary layers there. So they're laid down and called beds, as you can see there in your notes. They're strata or beds. But we, have, we see them wherever we go, in fact. You'll see them in road cuttings where they build highways. You will see them even in desert areas where the landscape is being uh, eroded away. You can still see the lovely layers are all still there. And there you go. You can see they're all still doing it along those lines. Looks good. How do scientists say this happened? What they say is that each one of those layers was created by a different flood. And that's what I taught around the world. That this layer was put down in one flood, and later another layer came and put down another, another flood came and put down another layer. Maybe a couple of millimetres, maybe some centimetres, some inches. So these layers were all put down by each by a flood. I'll come back to that. There is a second problem. When you take sediment out and put it somewhere else, you're putting it upon another landscape, aren't you? There's another landscape there. And you're taking that sediment and you're putting it on top of that landscape. We have a problem with that. Let me explain this diagram. Don't try and... I throw up scientific diagrams. I don't want you to really get too worried about them. Let's say that the top there, that irregular surface, that's the landscape today. You've got hills, you've got valleys, and so on. When we look underneath, we see these lovely layers of sediment going down like that. But guess what we do not find around the world? That sediment should have been put on another landscape like that, and we don't see it. Where is the past landscape? All around the world we see this. I'm going to show you the Grand Canyon. There is no past landscape. In other words, whatever was there before was totally destroyed. Totally washed away. You see what I'm saying? So I, I start thinking something big has happened in this planet, on this earth. We should be seeing other landforms under the existing ones. If we are 300 million, 500 million, a billion years old, where are the previous landscapes on this planet? We don't see them. They've been washed away. Here's a lovely layer here between two beds. Just a, a different rock types there, the shale below and the sandstone above. We use big words, but in, in reality, they're just meaning the particle size. Sandstone is made of sand. Shale is a finer material. Now, you see there a beautiful layer. Again, I have problems with these beautiful layers. That layer doesn't run just a few metres. That layer will go for hundreds of kilometres. Perfectly smooth layer. And you might go, well, that's OK because there was one flood, and then another flood came and put the next sediment on top of the first sediment, because they're both sediments. They put the sandstone on top of the shale. And that's what the universities say. Except that, when they decided to measure how old those rocks are, they found, in fact, 
that there is a time gap of six million years. In other words, between the shale layer and the sandstone, for six million years, nothing happened. There was no rainfall that would cause erosion. There was no wind blowing that would cause destruction. There were no plants growing where you would see the roots in the rocks. They said for six million years nothing happened. Now that's not the only location. If we go to the Grand Canyon, we find layer after layer after layer. Oh yes, this layer was put down and then the next flood didn't come for 20 million years. And then the next flood didn't come for 10 million years. Does this sound sensible to you? It did not sound sensible to me as a scientist and I really struggled with much of that. And I think I've got that in the notes there. I'm just going to turn the page so I'm keeping up with you and your note writing. As we turn the page, in fact, I mentioned there's no evidence of organic material. Now, what do I mean by that? It's called bioturbation. Big word. Don't have to remember it again. I'm not going to examine you. It simply means that every time you put down new sediment, what happens in the next few days and the few weeks? If the sediment sits there, what do you think happens? I'm not going to remove the sediment, but something's going to happen to it. And I see it here, just walking the streets. First thing that's going to happen to it is seeds are going to start growing out of the sediment, aren't they? You're going to get weeds or plants growing out of it. You're also going to get worms and other organisms that drill into it. So in other words, the sedimentary layer put down beautifully, uniform, so beautiful, will be destroyed within weeks because the, the root vegetation, as you see on the left, in a newly deposited sediment, the roots go down. And if that sediment on the left there was to turn into a rock, the roots the evidence of the roots, they might be gone, but the evidence that they were there would still be there. You would still see the furrows and, the, and the, 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 the channels that they went down. Likewise, I've just put there some crabs on the surface of some beach sediment. They start to turn it over. So here's my question. If all around the world, when sediments are put down, immediately they begin to get changed and broken up, how come when we go back to these sediments and look at these layers, we don't find any evidence, no evidence of biological activity. No previous plants or trees, no worms. You think, scientists today, we can, we can find worm channels in rocks if they're there. We can find them in more modern ones, but not in these ones. So bioturbation should be there evidence of biological activity and it's not there all around the world so I'm not talking about being, uh, living in one university I traveled the world and so I became highly confused it was not what I was taught was not what I was seeing as I traveled the world another interesting feature is that on top of the plateaus you have these boulder fields which is the next one there boulder fields now there's a cobble or a boulder a good size that is on top of the plateau and it's not one on top of the plateau in northwestern Wyoming guess how many are there on top of that plateau there are one billion of those rocks beautifully rounded with what we call little concussion marks where they bumped into other rocks now where would you normally see a rock like that do you have any idea where you'd you do see them but normally you would see them at the bottom of a river. It's the bed load. The rocks become smooth and rounded. So my question was, here we have a giant plateau up here in the air, in the sky, you know, so to speak, high above the ground, the sea level. On top of that plateau is one billion of these rocks. And where did they come from? From a rock that is 500 kilometers away. 
500 kilometres, those rocks had to be washed and rolled. And we know there is no velocity or speed of water on this planet today that could do that. So something again happened in the past, a volume of water we've never experienced, moving at a speed we've never experienced. If you go to South Africa, you'll find another plateau with another billion of these rocks, these boulder fields on top. So the whole picture is wrong from an evolutionary point of view. You also find these, what they call polystrate fossils, the next one. What does it mean? It means that you see a tree trunk there and it seems to be growing through the rock layers or it was there and the sediment was put around the tree over a long period of time. Now these are not uncommon. If you ever do come to South East Queensland, where my wife and I live, from the border of New South Wales up to Gympie, which is about 300 kilometres distance, under our ground is again hundreds of millions of these tree trunks like that, that have become fossilised underground. Now here's something interesting. Those trees do not have any roots. That's not where they grew. Their roots and they've been snapped off. They have no branches or leaves. They've been snapped off. And so, how were they formed? How are they there? Well, one interesting scientist made a comment. He said this, and this is the British coal fields where they have lots of these polystrate fossils, these trees. He says the coal fields are about a thousand meters deep. And they believe they were put there over 10 million years. He said then assuming a constant rate of sediment keeping being deposited by many floods, it would have taken 100,000 years to bury the 10 metre high tree. Do you think a tree could sit there for 100,000 years waiting to be buried? No, it will rot and decompose and fall apart. So he says, that's ridiculous. Alternatively, you could say that if the 10 metre tree was buried in 10 years so that it didn't rot, that would mean that you would need 1,000 kilometres in a million years of sediment. In other words, in one million years, we'd expect to see 1,000 kilometres of sediment deposited at that same rate. He said this is equally ridiculous. So what causes this? Well, Mount St. Helens gave us the answer. Isn't that lovely? Mount St. Helens, when it blew up, shattered the trees all around the area. It snapped them off with no roots and burnt their branches off. So thousands of these logs, these tree uh, uh, stumps, or tree logs, the uh, trunk, went washed downstream into lakes. And there they all floated on the lake until they decided to sink to the bottom. But guess what happened? And we were so stunned. We'd never seen this before. They didn't sink down like this. Guess what they all did? They all turned upright in the water, standing, floating upright in the water, and then they went down like that and stuck themselves into a bit of sediment and then more sediment keeps burying them. In other words, when you see these tree trunks in the rock face, it came because of a massive water amount and flooding and they turned and simply got deposited with the sediment. Incredible. Now that doesn't happen in a, you know, over millions of years. It has to happen fast. I'm going to get a little bit more interesting and, and deeper here, so don't, if you don't follow me, don't worry. I hope I've given you enough evidence already that indicated to me nothing was old, everything was quite new and unique, and I'll come back to that. But there are water gaps all around the world. We used to think they were rare. Now what is a water gap? A water gap is simply when a small river cuts through a mountain range as though it didn't exist. Now that river is an arid river, virtually nothing in it. 
How did it cut cliff faces like that? And I'll go back to the previous slide. That Fink River is that photograph you saw a moment ago. That Fink River cuts through many mountain ranges. It could have simply gone around them, but it didn't. This little river cuts through big mountain ranges. Now some of the mountains are tilted this way, some of them are tilted this way. You think the river would struggle with that. No, it just cut through them. So I was given the opportunity to go to Alice Springs, where this is, and climb down there and take photographs. I loved it. I went with a friend. As we climbed down, I climbed down sensibly. He didn't. He just went, ah, boom, 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 boom. And that's okay. He lived. And it was all good. So I made him sit there and went and took more photographs. And then I had to help him back to his vehicle. But it was all good fun because we're scientists. And we will go and do whatever we have to do. Even if it hurts us, we will do it to get the true picture. And so these sort of images here, these water gaps, there are some more there. How this little creek on the left can just carve through a mountain range. How is that possible? And there I am standing next to the little creek and the rocks are tilted like this. That little creek should not be able to cut through rocks like that, tilted like that. So that's the Simpson Gap one. So that's the polystrate fossils. What I'm trying to indicate there that a lot of erosion and uh, features like plateaus and so on are, uh, or depositional features are there. The last one I'll touch upon Although water gaps, sorry, was an erosional one. The last one there is the underfit rivers. Now this one might seem a little complicated, but it's because of our new satellite technology that we were able to understand this. Around the world, we had no idea. We thought rivers carved their valleys. We thought each river carved the valley. We have since learned most rivers don't belong in that valley. They could not have carved that valley. How do we work that out? because we had satellites. So a valley that appears to have been carved by a much, much larger river is what we call an underfit. It's undersized. Now this image here might seem strange. What you see there is a, a river channel doing lots of little meanders on a floodplain. But you'll see the floodplain also does a bigger meander. Can you see that? If I can do that here, there's your little channel doing lots of meanders, but the floodplain is doing big meanders. Now, floodplains don't meander. Ah, there you go. I can use that. Thank you. My wife is technological. I am not. So you see there the little river going around, lots of meanders everywhere, but the big valley is supposedly meandering. And you can see it very clearly on that side, lots of little meanders, but there's the big one meandering. Now we only saw that from satellite. We never really mapped that quite well. So what am I saying? I'm saying that there you are, there is your, there is your river meandering, and there's your floodplain today. But we found out that's not true. That's not what happened. If we go back further into space and have a look, there is our little meandering river going around all over the place, meandering everywhere, but there is your bigger meandering valley. Except that when we started to look over here at the sediments and over here over the sediments, what we found was this. That that valley is not a valley, it's a previous gigantic river and it's on the plateau. And this area on the side is the floodplain. In other words, in the past there was not a little river following a meandering floodplain, it was a gigantic river on a massive floodplain called the plateau. How much bigger? Well, the amount of water needed to create that river would be 20 to 60 times larger than we see today. That, ladies and gentlemen, is physically impossible. If I talk to you about a 100-year flood, it may be this big. 
A 200 year flood is not twice the size. It's only a little bit bigger. A 300 year flood is only a little bit bigger. So how is it that we can have a flood that is 20 times bigger or 60 times bigger in these same catchment areas? Impossible. You could not rain that hard. So, what I'm trying to get you a picture here as we go into the formation of the Grand Canyon and I want you to see this. All of those linked together. We have all around the world plateaus. They are sediments. On one side seems to be a gorge. On the other side is a gentle plateau. The plateaus are covered with boulder fields as though a big river once ran on top. I just proved to you that big rivers did run on top with these giant rivers on top of the plateaus that today the little rivers simply occupy it. But they never created those valleys. Same with the gorges, they did not create those valleys. Let's have a look at the Grand Canyon that illustrates that. You can see there the lovely layers of sediment, the river that's cut down almost like a water gap, not quite but like it. So when you look at the Grand Canyon there, all those things that I'm talking about are seen there. You will see the plateau across the top, beautifully flat. You will see the many, many sedimentary layers, beautifully, beautifully laid out, different colours. What's interesting is they are filled with billions of marine fossils. Marine fossils. Does that tell you something? It's not land fossils. It's marine. It's 99% of all fossils are marine. So that was not on a continent. That was in the oceans or at the bottom of a major flood. You then see time gaps. All of those layers, 10 million years, 20 million years, whatever it is, 6 million years. There's the absence of any organic material or any worms. Over all that history, there is no evidence of biological activity. And then you see no prior eroded landscape. Let me show you there is no previous landscape in the Grand Canyon. If you look at that, there's all your sedimentary layers all piled up, one on the other, all running flat. But you come down to your bedrock and your bedrock is flat. Where's the past landscape? What was there before the sediments were put in the Grand Canyon area? Nothing. Or perhaps there was, and it was washed away. And so what I'm trying to get across to you is an idea, a different way of thinking about what we are taught in universities. In other words, there was a, this is, now this is me as a non-Christian. Remember, I was not a Christian. I was a scientist. I came up with the idea that all around the world the evidence said this. There was a global flood smashed up the whole planet, put all the sediment down under the ocean, filled with marine fossils. And the Lord says in one of the Psalms, I will raise the land with my hand and lower the sea floor. So as it's raised, the sedimentary layers are all raised up. But as the sedimentary layers come up and form plateaus, there's still water there. So the water has to rush off the plateaus as the Lord raises the land when it rushes off and starts to gather into large channels on the steep side, it cuts down deeply into gorges. But on the more gentle side, it just creates large river patterns as it flows off. But as soon as that water's gone, there's no more changing of the landscape. And so what does the new river channel do? It simply takes advantage of the old river created during the global flood at the end of the flood. In other words, everything I saw either showed a global flood occurred or was evidence of the end of the global flood. Isn't that interesting? Do you think you can say that as a scientist in a university and be popular? No, you cannot. What did I come up with the conclusion is the floodwaters as they ended created the Grand Canyon in this case from the top down and the Colorado River today did not carve the, the, the valley. The Colorado River didn't do that. It was eroded 
through massive runoff as the Lord raised the land, the water poured off, carving the Grand Canyon. Even Charles Darwin came to Katoomba in Australia, looked at the Katoomba Valley, which is magnificent as well, and he said no river could ever do that. And we have monitored rivers all around the world for 100 years. They cannot do that. So the majority of rivers do not belong in those valleys. They simply take advantage. They didn't create the valleys. They simply occupy them because it's the easiest way out. And God said, and this confused me, I'd heard of this, and behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth. That's what I heard. And so I now believe the Bible was correct. Isn't that interesting? As a scientist, I'm proving the Bible is correct. This can't be right, but everything I looked at pointed to the Bible is correct. Did I willingly give my life to Christ? Not willingly. I made a comment at university that I think God exists. Do you think that's a popular comment? Do you think academics would like that comment? No, most of them, some of them were really bad, writing notes on my door, all sorts of things which I thought was interesting. An academic will put their name on any paper to be famous, but they won't put their name on a derogatory letter that they stick to your door. It's interesting, but I could recognise their handwriting because I was head of the department. But anyhow, one scientist, an, an a, a ecological, biologically trained person, got a bit worried about me in some senses and started to ask me questions about this. I didn't know the answers, so I said, maybe, maybe have a look at the Bible. She hadn't had a look at the Bible, and so she came back with lots of other questions that I didn't know the answers to. And I said, what are you reading? And she said, well, the book of Genesis. Now, I knew enough of Christianity to go, I don't think you're supposed to read the book of Genesis first. You're supposed to read the Gospels. And so she went away and started reading those. And then she said to me one day, take me to your church, because she thought I was a Christian. Because I said, I think God exists. And I resisted it for a long time. But then, one day I said, okay, we'll go to a church. And we didn't, certainly she wasn't quite aware it was a church. Because it, if you're an atheist, as she was, and I'm now an agnostic, if you're an atheist, you expect the church to have a big organ in there. Not music, not a band. You expect churches to have glass you know, stained windows, not clear windows. You expect them to have wooden pews, not these lovely seats. And so we, you know, she was a bit confused, but we were in there, and we don't remember what the pastor said at all. But the pastor in the end called people to Christ, asking them to raise their hands. Now I want you to understand, an atheist dragged an agnostic into a church no Christians were involved. Isn't that fascinating? At the end of the service, when he said, raise your hands, guess what she did? She put her hand up. An atheist put her hand up and gave her life to Christ. She looked at me. And guess what she saw? I had my hand up. I also gave my life to Christ. So ladies and gentlemen, if an atheist can drag an agnostic into church and become Christians, we have to be a little bit more reflective in thinking about how we help people come to Christ because God will take advantage of any situation where people are exploring and trying to understand who is Christ. He will always bless us in that way. Did we struggle with each other after that? No. A year and a half later, we got married. Julie is now working in uh, women's ministry, working in a Christian high school, and I'm with Creation Ministries International. The flood was rejected by my colleagues, rejected because in the 17th and 18th century, we rejected these sedimentary layers. We said they're too deep. In the 17th and 18th century, the scientists said, no, it cannot be. It has to be multiple catastrophes. Each big layer was a multiple catastrophe. By the 18th and 19th century, we were arguing, no, it must be slow rates of deposition. Every little flood puts a layer down. But today, because of the evidence that not only have I found, but so many other scientists have found, we know there was a catastrophe. We know it. So now they argue, well, we'll have both. 
will have general sedimentation and catastrophes and therefore you can't argue against us anymore. How silly is that as an academic to want both of those? So the flood is rejected. I won't go into this any more than, uh, oh sorry, this I will go into. Our creation magazine is our number one product around the planet. It is the number one product and I think I have an example here. If you're uncertain, please have a good look at them. This has gone on for 40 years, is in translated into many languages, by the way, so you can ask that question as well. Inside each one, it is written for you, not for scientists. So it gives us the latest information that's happening. Beautiful, beautiful images, beautiful quality paper. Do we make any money on this? No. Why? Because we want to get it into your hands to feed you to link to you and feed you and then what do we want to do? We want you to do what with this? Give it away. When I was in hospital with my brain surgery, my wife brought in all these. We put them out there for the nurses and they loved them. You can just give these away. People want this. Why? Because it's the same thing I wanted. I wanted to know who am I? What is my purpose in life? What is my role in life? I found it through Christ. Everyone else is doing the same question. They will find it through here as well. So that is an incredible magazine. Now if you do, uh, oh it's got there another, other things that we've got there, some kids material downstairs, um, biblical geology, that's a great one as well. But I'm trying to get to the, let's go back, the prices. There we go. So we're looking at it there, you can see the prices there, uh, if you get a one year subscription you get a free DVD as well, three years will drop the price and also you'll get an equivalent of being able to pick up another book such as this one that uh, Don mentioned, not Don, I keep getting those two mixed up, Con mentioned, which is you'd get that free if you signed up for three years. Now did my wife and I sign up and spread it? Yes we did. She was from an atheistic family. I was from an alcoholic family. Today something about half of her family have given their life to Christ and about a third of my family have stopped drinking and given their lives as well. Isn't that interesting? It's because we gave it and then we shared the magazine and shared our testimony and our two families have changed over time. It's so wonderful to do that. We've got a lot of material downstairs. I know you've been down there and had a good look at it and all the rest. Now that it's coming to this time, deep time, there's all these incredible, incredible um, uh, books. This one, by the way, I really recommend. It is the biggest challenge we face today. 70 to 80 percent of our young people going to universities will walk away from Christ. That's how bad it is in, in universities at the moment. I won't go through a lot of other questions. I'm actually only going to go through one and I'm going to help you understand this one that, that uh, Con raised, and that is the word Yom, the six day one. I'm just going to give you an example of how we can use this because as, as uh, Con said, throughout the Bible it is used as a number, when it's used as a number and with an evening and a morning it is interpreted as a 24 hour. The point is that word is used throughout the Bible and is used as a 20, it has other meanings as well, but when it's used with a number or evening and morning, in the context it's used, it's a 24 hour period. So why do we challenge it in Genesis 1? Why does everybody challenge it? And the most important thing, as Con put up, is that in Exodus 28 to 11, it is written there. And you've read that. Let me just finish off with this wonderful little testimony. A pastor came up to me in one church when we were in this church and he said, Ron, I struggle with this six days. I struggle. I struggle with Genesis 1. And I said, oh, he's a pastor. And I thought, okay, he's a lovely man. I love the guy, wonderful man. And so I said to him, but what do you think of Exodus 2011? He looked at it for a moment and he went, Exodus 2011. He said, you're talking about the fourth commandment. I said, yes. And he went, oh, yeah, it says there in six days. And I said, well, who wrote 
Exodus 20.11. Who wrote it? Now he was almost about to say Moses. But then he stopped and realizes Moses did not write that. Who wrote it? Our Lord wrote it. Our Lord wrote that. It is one of the Ten Commandments. He said, I did it in six days, rested on the seventh. And the pastor was like, oh my goodness. And I said, yes. Who are you challenging? Are you challenging the author of the book of Genesis? Or are you challenging Jesus? Or are you challenging our Father? Who are you challenging? And he was like, oh no, I've never thought of it that way. I was only challenging Genesis 1. I didn't realize that the Lord put it, I never made the connection, he said, that Exodus 20, verse 11 especially, is exactly what I'm criticizing. I'm criticizing one of the Ten Commandments. Does that mean I can go to the other commandments now and ignore them? When God said, don't kill, is that okay? We can go and kill? You know, it just seems illogical. But the fourth commandment also has something different about it compared to every other commandment. I want you to have a good look at this commandment. It's the only commandment where the reason is given. Because it says there, he said, I want you to do this. I did this in this manner. I want you to do it in this manner. He said, that's, that's why I did it. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and all, this, all of this. And so he blessed the Sabbath. In other words, what am I trying to say? The Lord didn't just say, I did it in six days and rested on the seventh. It's the one commandment where he didn't just say that. He said, I did it in six days and rested on the seventh because I want you to work for six days and rest on the seventh. It's the only commandment with the reason. So if we reject that, as Dr. Kahn pointed out, we're not just rejecting the author the writer of the book of Genesis. We're rejecting Christ himself who used it. We're rejecting God. And it is the one, the one commandment where he gave us the reason, and I think he gave us the reason because he realizes we're going to challenge that one. We are one day going to challenge that one. But he gave us the reason. And I think that is magnificent and all of that. So I'm going to end right there because this is when I started an hour ago and uh, finish there. I was going to talk about more. We'll chat about other things later on. But it's time, desperately time, for lunch. Is it not? Any questions before I step down? By the way, question time. Please do not hold back on questions. We love questions. The deeper the better. And if you stay here for the extra half hour or whatever it is of questions, you don't ask questions, I'm going to ask you questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's just uh, close with a word, word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time where we are able uh, to...